Hi there, Physics 151. I know you'll be learning about special relativity in class, but I thought I would give this quick video intro uh, of relativity for the practicals coming in the 10th week of practicals. Here's the speed limit. Please do not exceed uh, the speed of light. So first of all, I wanna do a quick little question for you about what you think. Here's a flashlight, it's a thought experiment. A flashlight is moving along at 25% the speed of light. 0.25 C, and it's shining light out in front of it. And you observe these light waves um, from the ground at rest. So how fast do these light waves pass you? Do they pass you at C, or do they pass you at 1.25 C? Well, this is easy to measure. The answer turns out to be C. And it kind of makes sense. Light is a wave, after all, and so the laws of physics determine how fast an electromagnetic wave will travel by. It doesn't matter if the source is, is moving. But now, let's look at a different reference frame. Let's imagine it from the point of view of the person who's holding the flashlight. So now, I guess here's that observer on the Earth. That was, that was you. This is the, this, the astronaut. The observer at the Earth is now moving to the left at 0.25 C. The person holding the flashlight is just watching light um, come out of his flashlight. So the question is, how fast do the light waves emerge from the front of the flashlight as observed by the moving person who's holding the flashlight? Do you think it's C? Or do you think they'll see the light coming out slower at 0.75 C? The answer, again, pretty easy to measure. Uh, it turns out to be C. Both observers measure the same speed of the same light. It's getting a little weird now, um, but it still sort of makes sense. Velocity is all relative, and all the laws of physics should be the same for someone holding a flashlight who's moving. There's uh, you know, the laws of the propagation of electromagnetic waves for that person uh, should be the same as for the person that's down on the ground. And in fact, uh, the way this was measured, people were resistant to this idea and had this idea that maybe light should be in a luminiferous ether. ether. And so as the uh, Earth orbits the Sun and the Sun orbits the center of the Milky Way galaxy at 220 kilometers per second, um, you would think that light should be carried downstream or up upstream. But uh, the Michelson-Morley experiment in 1887 um, discovered that there was no variation uh, in the speed of light for a time of year going in this the same direction. It was always uh, within their experimental uncertainties of the speed of light. So there was no ether discovered. Light just always travels at speed, at speed C, relative to the person doing the observing, okay? Even if the observer is moving relative to the rest of the universe. So, and this is what it says in night. It says, how can this be? If observers moving at different speeds observe the same light pulse to be moving at the same speed, how could that be? It turns out that the problem is that the stopwatches and the meter sticks are different for the different observers. They have different notions of time and they have different notions of length. Okay. So space and time are relative to your frame of reference. And it's the only way to resolve this. And so actually in 1904, almost as a joke, Lorentz wrote down these Lorentz transformations saying, look, if these Michelson-Morley experiments were true, we would have these ridiculous, you know, light and uh, space and time would be, would be relative to your, to your, uh, to your velocity. And um, I don't think he really meant it to be taken seriously, but uh, a year later, uh, Albert Einstein did exactly that, took it seriously and said, okay, well, if this is the way it is at fast speeds, then here's a whole lot of consequences of these Lorentz transformations. And he wrote down the, these, these famous papers um, uh, in 1905 about um, special relativity. Okay, so this is a little, the moral of this story is a little tale about the scientific method. What you do is you do careful repeatable experiments and publish your results of what you see. If the theory that's been before doesn't match the experiments, in this case it was Newtonian mechanics, was not matching what they were seeing, then the theory is wrong and must be modified. And that's what Einstein did. It came along and came out with relativity, which is 
different than Newtonian mechanics. So here we are, and this is the, the basis of uh, relativity comes from light travels at speed C in all inertial reference frames. That's the, that's the basic idea. And it's true, every experiment to date, even up to 2020 has found that light travels at exactly this speed in every inertial reference frame, regardless of how reference frames are moving with respect to each other. There are some consequences of this. Um, so this means that moving clocks run slower. I'll show that to you in a second. Uh, moving objects are shorter along the direction, direction of motion. So this, the first one is time dilation, the second one is length contraction. Uh, it also means that moving objects uh, have sort of more inertia. Basically, this is, and they have energy. So energy is E equals MC squared. It also means that as you approach the speed of light, your energy goes infinite. And so you, you can't accelerate uh, to or, or certainly not beyond the speed of light. All these things are different, of course, than, than Newtonian mechanics. And so a light clock is made of two parallel mirrors separated by a vacuum and held at a fixed distance d. So you can imagine this thing on the left being a light clock. The light is a light wave or a pulse or something is bouncing off and it goes tick, 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 tick. <laughs> Every time it bounces, it makes a tick sound. But if you, may, if you have the same clock and it's moving relative to you from left to right, well, it's, these light pulses are going to have to travel on a diagonal. And so the, the clock is going to run slow. But then the trick is here is to imagine that you're in the reference frame of the moving clock. Well, in that reference frame, the light pulse has this, this same distance that, that it is on the left. That's what it would look like for you. So uh, what it means is that you think slower, your blood pumps slower, everything, time itself must slow down in the moving reference frame so that the observer can think they're not moving relative to the light clock. So that's how that goes. Um, the moving clock must tick slower since light travels farther. So this leads to the twin paradox. So bear with me here. Fred and George are identical. And so they have identical lifespans, let's say. And they each hold a light clock. And the light clock ticks every millisecond. So if you multiply that out, if they're going to live for 80 years, each one of them should expect to look at their light clock and see, count off the 2.5 trillion uh, ticks over their life before they would expect to die. So what happens is Fred goes on his broomstick and flies at 20% uh, of the speed of light, while George stays at the ground on Earth. Okay. So George sees these 2.5 million ticks, waits for his whole life to go by, while Fred spends his whole life traveling at 20% the speed of light. So over George's lifespan, if he sees Fred flying away, how many of these ticks on Fred's light clock will George observe? Will he, he observe more than 2.5 trillion or fewer? Remember, it's instead of tick, 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 there's tick, 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 so he's going to observe fewer than 2.5 trillion. So what's going to happen is if he's about to die, Fred will live longer. So this is like the fountain of youth. If you travel fast enough, time slows down for you, you live longer. Um, so Fred will probably have more life to live, okay, is the idea. Now, here's where it comes to the paradox. Fred is flying on his broomstick to the right at 20% of the speed of light. He looks in his rearview mirror and he sees George back there on Earth, who now, in Fred's reference frame, is moving 20% the speed of light backwards. So if Fred, while he's flying through space on his broomstick, measures 2.5 trillion ticks of his clock, which is stationary relative to him, how many ticks of George's clock does Fred observe? And again, since George's clock back on Earth is going to look like the slow one from Fred's point of view, okay? So which twin dies first depends on your inertial reference frame. Time is relative to each observer. This is only an apparent paradox because there's no actual uh, causal implications of this. Fred and George die at places that are very distant away from each other. So 
they can't say, you know, communicate any useful information to each other at the day of their death um, over that big distance because Fred has flown so far away at 20% the speed of light. So it, it, we really think that this is this is the way it happens. And then if you know Fred makes a round trip and comes back. Uh, then it's no longer special relativity because he's accelerating and, and his clock slows down for, for a different reason. So that's, I think, a little intro of special relativity for you. Um, hopefully a little warm up and you'll be going through um, some exercises during practicals and your TA will be there to help you through them. Okay, enjoy. Bye.